Hello and welcome to our webinar, There Is No Sugar Coating It, Managing the Canine Diabetic, sponsored by BI and Covetris. I'm Amy Booker and I'll be your host today. Today is September 9th and it is still 2020. Our live webinar participants will earn two continuing educa education credits today. It will be a one hour webinar for two credits. If you're watching a recording of this webinar, you will not be eligible to receive any CE for it. Our live participants can ask questions of our presenter. At any point during the presentation, type your questions into the questions pane of your GoToWebinar control panel, and they will be answered during the Q&A session at the end. A copy of the presentation is also available in the handouts pane of your control, control panel. Um, go ahead and click that link. It will open up in your browser, and you can download the PDF if you like. I'm very excited to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Audra Fenimore. Dr. Fenimore graduated from Colorado State University, CSU, and completed her small animal internal medicine and surgery rotating internship at Red Bank Veterinary Hospital in Red Bank, New Jersey. She went on to complete a Nestle Purina internal medicine slash shelter postdoctoral fellowship at Colorado State. She then completed a small animal internal medicine residency at CSU. Dr. Fenimore is board certified by the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. She's an internal medicine specialist at the VRCC Veterinary Specialty and Emergency Hospital in Englewood, Colorado. Dr. Fenimore, we are ready for your presentation. Great, Amy. Thanks so much for that introduction. Just real quickly, am I in a presentation mode? You are there not. There you go. There it is. Perfect, perfect. Well, thank you everyone for for joining me today. I'm I'm so excited to be here and I know this is our new reality doing everything from home and being virtual and a big special thanks to BI and Covetris for allowing us to use this virtual platform to come together and to continue to share information. So let's jump right in here. For the next 45 minutes, we'll be discussing the canine diabetic. And then at the end of the lecture, I'd love to entertain some questions. So without further ado, we'll get started. And so just hitting up some of the agenda items for, for the next lecture hour, moving into talking about the diabetic etiology in the dog, the clinical signs, diagnosis. I know many of you vets and, and veterinary technicians are so adept at picking up on the clinical signs associated with this endocrinopathy and diagnosing this endocrinopathy where we'll breeze through the first couple of slides because I really want to spend the majority of time talking about setting realistic treatment goals for our diabetic patients and their owners talking about avoiding common treatment errors that can occur and and really spending some time talking about our insulin options because there are some new products on the line that that we're excited to share with you today so if you haven't checked out the 2018 aha guidelines for managing the diabetic dog and cat i suggest you refer to this publication it's a great way to refresh us on how we should be managing, working up, and treating our diabetic patients. Um, but as everything ages, you know, this publication is now two years old where it's not as up to date with, you know, the new insulin options that we have on hand today. So pretty excited to share with you at the end of our lecture. Again, insulin, insulin options we have for managing our diabetic dogs. So talking about canine diabetes mellitus etiologies, it's likely multifactorial as, as we're well aware. And, and the majority of time these dogs are gonna present to us uh, being the type one or the insulin dependent diabetic where they have undergone some sort of scenario where they have lost, their beta cells have lost the ability to secrete insulin to help regulate blood sugar levels. And so when we think about the factors that may contribute to the development of diabetes, certainly genetic predisposition has to play a role in some shape or form uh, as these dogs develop diabetes during their young, middle age, um, older onset. Uh, and, and it's interesting because take a moment and think about the diabetic dogs that are currently under, under your care and, and think about the breeds. Um, that have been associated with diabetes. So, you know, we tend to think of our cute little poodly dogs or our schnauzer terrier mixes. Um, but think about how many 
German shepherds or boxer diabetics you've managed. And so, you know, it's it's just interesting. I mean, for me, maybe in the last 11 years, I haven't managed a, a, a diabetic German shepherd yet, and, and that's okay. That breed has kept me plenty busy with all of the other GI issues that 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 they come to me with. But it really drives home the point that, yeah, there are certain breeds that we associate with the development of diabetes where in other breeds like the shepherd or the boxer, perhaps there's some sort of protective mechanism where they're not developing this endocrine disease as commonly as our other breeds. So future direction as far as studying the etiology of, of diabetes in our, in our dogs. Concurrent disease processes certainly can predispose our dogs to developing diabetes. Really severe inflammatory processes like pancreatitis, infiltrative neoplasias of the pancreas, um, or you know we see a certain percentage of our of our Cushing's patients over time with insulin resistance from excessive endogenous steroid production where they end up developing diabetes uh, from that other endocrinopathy. In people, environmental factors uh, have been identified more so in, in humans who have experienced diabetes, but I think, again, this is a point of research for us in the veterinary profession as far as what environmental factors contribute to the development of diabetes in our, in our canine patients, so just wanted to briefly touch upon that. And many of you, again, are well adept at picking up on which clinical signs uh, become obvious in our diabetic patients, whether it's feedback from our owners with the clinical symptoms uh, they're appreciating in their dogs at home, uh, to your physical exam findings with cataract formation, chronic wasting, and peripheral neuropathies and, and generalized weakness that often accompanies this endocrinopathy. The diagnosis of diabetes is pretty straightforward, right? So in light of clinical symptoms that matched with the diabetic patient, these patients are hyperglycemic and glucosuric. But really it's that first appointment when we're seeing that diabetic patient and we're diagnosing them for the first time that really that is a, a crucial period where we come to understand how this is going to go with our diabetic patients. Is this going to be the straightforward diabetic where nothing else is going on, the patient is otherwise healthy, or is this a dog where this patient has a history of chronic urinary tract infections or terrible skin disease or dental disease that may play a role in making it a challenge for us as veterinary professionals to manage the diabetic dog. Perhaps even before the patient developed diabetes, we had a clinical suspicion that this patient could have Cushing's. Um, or perhaps these patients come to us where previously they've had really bad pancreatitis episodes, or, or they have this chronic intermittent GI history of picky appetite, vomiting, intermittent soft stool, where these other disease conditions may play a role in complicating the diabetic patient. And as veterinary professionals, it is so important for us to really do a good baseline physical exam, get our blood work in gear, get a good history, understand what comorbidities are present, because in the end, that's what's going to set everybody up for success in setting reasonable expectations as far as what should we expect as the veterinarian, as the owner, um, in treating this diabetic dog. What can we expect? Is this going to be a straightforward diabetic or is this going to be a bit of a rocky path in trying to get this diabetic dog controlled? So setting reasonable expectations is so key in setting all of us up for success when we're managing the diabetic patient. And so what are some reasonable treatment goals we can present to our owners um, that really, again, set us up for success. And a reasonable goal would be resolution of clinical symptoms. So owners reporting back to us that PUPD has minimized. 
um, we're starting to gain some weight that we had once lost because diabetes is such a catabolic condition. Those would be, that would be a reasonable expectation to have, resolution of those clinical symptoms. And reminding ourselves that those clinical symptoms trump blood glucose numbers, always. Um, we'll talk about blood glucose and interstitial glucose monitoring system towards the end of the lecture, um, but you know, reminding us and reminding our owners that sometimes it can be easy to get caught up in the numbers, but ultimately it's what that patient is doing clinically that is the most important. And certainly trying to avoid hypoglycemic events is a, a reasonable expectation to have. Um, it is amazing to me how dogs can walk around with blood sugars in the 30s and 40s and clinically they are acting completely normal. And unfortunately, it comes to the point where owners come home and find their dog seizuring or minimally responsive because their blood sugars are so low. That's when we realize that, oops, perhaps we've overdone it with our insulin therapy. And how do we prevent it from getting to that point? Um, so avoiding hypoglycemic events is another reasonable expectation to once again set us all up for success. Now to the right on the screen, this is an app that the Royal Veterinary College offers. Um, I was able to download it on my iPhone. And it's a pretty nice user-friendly app that your clients can access. Again, you know, getting organized with understanding, you know, medications written down, being able to monitor their dog or cat's blood glucose levels. It's just a nice way for owners to stay organized with their pet's information and feel like they're playing an integral role in uh, managing their pet's diabetes. And through that app comes this diabetic clinical scoring system. So this is a really nice objective way to put a number to some of the subjective parameters that we're monitoring in our patients. So owners feel like, again, they're playing an active role in managing their pet's diabetes, where when they're reporting back to you during physical exam rechecks, you know, they're able to provide an objective number to each of these different parameters. The higher the number, the less controlled the diabetes is. But again, something useful, a tool that's useful to just help us better understand how diabetes is being regulated in our veterinary patients. Okay, so let's, let's spend some time talking about avoiding common treatment errors that we may come across during our everyday general practice when we're dealing with our diabetic patients. And we'll touch briefly through dietary management, insulin choice, insulin administration. Uh, and then from our end, uh, the, the errors that we can avoid in our monitoring of, of the diabetic patient. So traditionally, with regards to dietary management in our diabetic patients, at least in our canine patients, we typically think of a diabetic diet being comprised of um, a high insoluble fiber diet um, that may serve to benefit the diabetic patient in a number of ways. So a diet high in insoluble fiber essentially creates a feeling of satiety or fullness, um, but also a high insoluble fiber diet may also help prevent those postprandial blood sugar spikes that can make a diabetic uncontrolled. So insoluble fiber helps slow absorption of glucose from the GI tract in order to help avoid those extreme blood sugar spikes, particularly after a meal. However, with that being said, not every diet is perfect for every diabetic patient. And we can all recognize we treat a number of diabetics who have other issues going on. So especially our miniature schnauzers with pancreatitis, where they may need an ultra low fat diet to better serve in preventing their pancreatitis flare-ups, which would then better control their diabetes. And so Perhaps what's most important in the diabetic patient is that they are fed a well-balanced diet that's moderate in fiber 
that the diabetic patient is going to eat consistently every day, ideally twice a day, so that we can then set our owners up to be able to give insulin consistently one to two times a day as well. And so again, with each recheck, checking in with the owner as far as understanding, okay, what exactly is being given with regards to diet type, how much the owner is giving per meal, and dietary history also includes any snacks. Um, I try to be strict and say no snacks, at least initially when we're trying to get our diabetic patients better regulated, but certainly reintroducing snacks once we get the diabetes better controlled, maybe a conversation that you have with with your clients, but especially from the get-go, it's nice to know if they're getting peanut butter with their pills, pepperoni treats every time they come in from outside. Snacks can definitely interfere with our diabetic management, especially if they're being given throughout the day. And then exercise. So in moderation, we know that exercise can help the cells utilize glucose, which can better manage our diabetics. However, keeping exercise in moderation, and again, consistency is so key, whether we're talking about dietary management or whether we're talking about insulin administration, whether we're talking about exercise, keeping it consistent is so important in managing our diabetics. Okay, well, how do we avoid treatment errors with regards to our insulin selection? So we'll delve in more detail in a little bit regarding the intermediate acting and the longer acting insulins that are available to us. Um, but I bring this topic up because there are compounded insulin formulations out there that owners may reach for in order to help save money. I understand, we understand collectively as a profession, how expensive the treatment of diabetes can be when we're asking owners to come in for rechecks and blood work and diet and insulin. It all adds up very quickly. Um, but really staying away from compounded insulins, even if it can save a few bucks, is highly recommended. Anecdotally, we know that compounded formulations of insulin can have variable bioavailability, but it's not only just the anecdotal feedback, it's also published information when we've studied a variety of different compounded um, PZI formulations. So this was a study published in 2012 by Dr. Scott Moncrief, who took a look at 12 different compounded protamine zinc insulin preparations and found that out of those 12 preparations, only one actually met USB specification, specification excuse me, as far as providing, you know, adequate efficacy of, of what should be expected within an insulin preparation. One out of the 12 compounded formulations met those USP guidelines. And so really driving home the point that there can be such variability behind compounded formulations that especially when managing the diabetic patient, when we're trying to gain good control from the get-go, avoiding these formulations is, is strongly recommended. How do we avoid treatment errors when it comes to insulin administration? You know, is the owner not rotating injection sites? How is the owner mixing the insulin before drawing it back in the syringe? I think all of us, even though we are well familiar with the differences between U40 insulin syringes and U100 insulin syringes, the mix-up mistakes still happen. Um, and what about the owner drawing up the incorrect amount of insulin? Although these seem like simple things to avoid, it is amazing how they still tend to be common errors that happen um, among our veterinary patients. So with our U40 insulin preparations, uh, insulin preparations, which include the Vetsilin and the ProZinc uh, insulins that we have available, they come with their respective U40 insulin syringes. Um, whereas more of the human insulin analogs, they tend to be the U100 preparations and they have their own respective U100 insulin syringes. And so, you know, many benefits to the U40 insulin preparations and their respective insulins because 
it's a less concentrated insulin solution. We have 40 units of, of insulin per milliliter, whereas the human formulations or the human insulin analogs are a more highly concentrated insulin where there are 100 units of insulin per milliliter. So we can see the benefits with our U40 insulins in that, especially for our smaller dogs and our cats, we're able to administer an accurate amount, a smaller amount of insulin using our U40 syringes. So, you know, there are definitely benefits to reaching for our U40 insulins, um, but getting back to my point of avoiding error, this again, we need to emphasize during our recheck appointments exactly what type of insulin the owners are administering, but also what type of insulin syringes the owner is using as well. Incorrect insulin dosing, another common treatment error. So this is Jackson, he's my little cutie schnauzer um, who recently was hospitalized for uh, severe pancreatitis, which led to a DKA crisis. So we were able to stabilize him with the typical treatments that one would reach for. Um, and for him, because he's a schnauzer and because he had severe pancreatitis, I like to reach for Detamir in, in these particular patients because it's a very potent, longer acting insulin. And so he weighs a little bit over nine kilograms. So you see the starting dose, 2.5 units twice a day. Um, Detamir is a very potent insulin. So typically the starting dose is anywhere from 0 0.1 to 0 0.25 units per kg per injection. So a much lower starting dose than some of the other insulin preparations out there. So we started him on this insulin and um, placed a Freestyle Libre, which again, we'll talk about monitoring systems towards the end of the lecture, and had the owner obtain some, some interstitial glucose readings from home. And so this is what he was doing on two and a half units twice a day. And didn't really like the 53, 54 mg per deciliter reading. So I said to the owners, okay, well, let's back off a little bit. We'll just do two units twice a day. But reaching the eight o'clock hour, he's too low to read. So I thought, okay, you know, clinically he's stable. He's not showing symptoms of hypoglycemia and his other glucose readings are, are pretty good otherwise, I'm really going to back off. I'm really going to back off his insulin to half a unit twice a day. And, and this is getting to be a, a, a small dose for, for a dog his size. But lo and behold, literally, literally low and behold, um, these readings are, they're not good. Reading too low, clinically he's still stable, but this, this, isn't, this isn't a good bl blood glucose curve. And so in talking to the owner, um, just reiterating again, what are you doing? Uh, how are you drawing back? When we discharge our patients from the hospital, I should mention, we have the luxury of spending about an hour with our clients as far as going through a diabetic demonstration, which I realize not everybody has that time, and, but we have the time to do that. And so we really take care as far as showing owners how to handle insulin. We draw up an insulin syringe with saline to exactly where that patient, you know, should, uh, the dose at which that patient should be receiving. We have the owner show us how to draw back on that insulin. We have the owner give the, the saline and the insulin syringe to the pet just to show us that they can successfully administer the insulin. So we really take a lot of time in going through our diabetic demos. And so despite spending an hour with this family and showing them exactly where to draw up on the insulin syringe, they were actually giving 25 units of the Detamir under the skin twice a day instead of two and a half units. And by golly, this dog is so lucky, and, and I thank his breed, being the schnauzer, and I thank his screaming pancreatitis that probably saved his life as to why he didn't pass away from that exorbitant volume of this long-acting potent insulin. So he just drives home the fact, again, that 
These mistakes can occur commonly. Now we take insulin syringes and mark it. We take a few insulin syringes and mark exactly where that patient is to, to you know, receive, letting the owners know how much insulin that patient should receive. And we send those insulin syringes home just to remind the owners that those are examples of where they should pull back on their insulin syringe. Because again, these mistakes, they continue to happen, even, even though we try to troubleshoot these, these situations. So from our end, as the veterinarian, um, how do we avoid treatment errors when we monitor the patient? So realizing that it takes several weeks for diabetic patients to become well-regulated. We, we shouldn't increase the dose too rapidly, and we certainly shouldn't increase the dose based on spot blood glucose levels. You know, if the patient is doing well clinically when you're checking in with the owner over that week of starting insulin, leave it be. If we are getting blood glucoses, if the owner wants to do that at home and we're getting low readings, then that's when we can decrease our insulin. But otherwise, if the patient is doing well clinically, leave it be, give it some time and leave it be. But also as veterinary professionals, failing to diagnose concurrent illnesses that would interfere with successful diabetic regulation is huge. We should be screening these patients through clinical history, blood work, physical exam findings, following, trying to find all of the sources of insulin resistance that may interfere with successful diabetic regulation. So keeping all of these things in mind, I know it sounds basic and simple, but it just still, after several years of practice, you think you have it down perfectly as far as explaining diabetes to our owners, um, but mistakes still happen. So go back to the basics and, and really be thorough in your history taking to understand, you know, if this is user error that's contributing to the challenging diabetic patient. All right, so a quick case, this is Lexi. She is an older Jack Russell Terrier, 13 years old, and she came to me with a history of uncontrolled diabetes. Clinically, the owner felt like she wasn't as well regulated as, as what she could be. So here's her weight, she's just over six kilograms and, and receiving a decent amount of Vetsulin twice a day. Her fasted general blood work revealed the following. So her glucose, 592. Her cholesterol in the fasted state is pretty elevated. We did a baseline T4 and it was less than 0 0.5 mics per DL. So we added on a few other thyroid hormone parameters and check out those thyroglobulin antibodies, 219%, a positive is greater than 25%. So, you know, this is a girl who has hypothyroidism that is being untreated and undiagnosed in addition to her diabetes, which is also uncontrolled at this time. So we started her on an appropriate dose of thyroid supplementation, but it's really important to remind ourselves, especially when we're treating these concurrent endocrinopathies like hypothyroidism or Cushing's, that as we're treating these comorbidities, we have to be careful with our insulin dose. So particularly again with hypothyroidism and Cushing's, backing off our insulin dose 10 to 20 percent uh, per injection um, becomes really important to, to help avoid hypoglycemia. And these are the dogs where if you want to follow them with, with continuous glucose monitoring or blood glucose curves, that's fine. We want to make sure we're not making these patients hypoglycemic as we're treating their other comorbidities. Great. Okay. It's nice to have insulin options. And I'm, I'm pretty excited to, to delve into this part of, of the lecture here. Um, we're pleased to announce that the FDA has approved Prozinc uh, for our diabetic canine patients. So now it's nice to not only be able to use this product for our cats, but also for our dogs as well. And so having a number of options to treat our diabetic patients 
is really exciting because not one insulin is perfect for every dog. So it's nice to have these options to reach for to really set us all up for success in, in managing our diabetic patients. So like ProZinc, we also have Vetsilin, which is the another U40 insulin suspension. And so again, having an FDA approved label for both of these insulins is, is incredibly important and puts a lot of credence behind these products. Um, millions of dollars are spent by these companies to get an FDA approved label for these therapies. And that gives us confidence as practitioners that these products have proven to be, through rigorous studies, they have proven to be efficacious and safe for our veterinary patients. But of course, it's nice to have these other U100 insulin options available to us as well. So our Novelins, our Humulins make up our NPH insulins. And then we also have our longer acting Detamir and Glargine insulins as well. So factors when choosing insulins. Again, you know, there is not one perfect insulin for every diabetic patient out there. So a lot goes into determining how we choose which insulins for our diabetic patients. And so the factors that go into choosing these insulins again, you know, it's nice to have an FDA approved label to back up the efficacy and safety of that product. And that's where our veterinary insulin formulations um, come into play. Certainly expense plays a huge role in our, in our, in our decision making, um, especially during these times of COVID where finances are even tighter than ever. Um, having different insulin options to choose from can be very important, especially when some are less expensive than others. Accurate dosing, again, I, I explained a little bit of this in a previous slide where our U40 insulin preparations and their respective insulin syringes can provide more accurate dosing in our smaller veterinary patients. So that may play a role when choosing different insulins. Certainly concurrent disease, um, you know, patients who have other complicating comorbidities, pancreatitis, chronic GI issues, uh, they can be harder diabetics to treat. That's the bottom line. And so different insulins may perform different, differently in those patients who have concurrent disease. Um, and then how the insulin behaves within the body, um, is incredibly important to realize in, in setting us up for success, in knowing the duration of action, the onset of action, of how insulin behaves within our patients becomes incredibly important in understanding whether or not our patients are gonna be controlled. I should back up a little bit. I wanted to explain um, in more detail, just going back to the expense of insulins because, you know, especially with human insulins, the cost is constantly changing. But to, to give you some examples, with our veterinary formulations, with ProZinc and, and with Vetsilin, the cost of those insulins probably run around like $60 to $120 per vial, I would say, whereas it definitely becomes more expensive as we get into our other human insulin analogs. So our, our NPH insulins probably run about $150 to $170 a vial. Um, and then certainly, oh my gosh, as we get into the, the Glargine and the Detamirs, I mean, we could be looking at $300 to $350 a pop. Um, so again, you know, just to, to give, give you an idea of insulin, the cost of what they're running these days, it, it certainly adds to the expense of the whole diabetic management situation. So, and, and there is a generic NPH out there that's pretty reasonable in cost. But again, you know, most of the human brand insulins are pretty, pretty expensive. So let's touch a little bit uh, upon this last bullet point here, how the insulin behaves within the body. Because really, this is going to determine how successful we are in managing the diabetic patient. And so just a real brief review here, not to get too 
nitty gritty into the the physiology, but it really is important for us to understand the mechanism of action of insulins as far as their duration of action is concerned, because ultimately that's going to determine whether or not we're successfully managing our diabetic patients. So let's touch upon regular insulin first here. So this is the, the type of insulin we reach for obviously when we have a patient who's in a diabetic ketotic crisis. So we need rapid decrease in, in blood sugar levels. Uh, we need a quick onset, I should say, quick onset and short duration of action to really titrate blood sugar levels in these dogs who are experiencing a crisis. And so essentially regular insulin is a crystalline zinc insulin that's dissolved in a clear solution. So it's in its soluble form. And being in its soluble form, whether it's given IV, IM, sub-Q, that's really going to be taken up by the body very quickly because it's in its soluble form providing rapid absorption. However, when we get into the more intermediate acting or, or lente insulins, we're gonna have a longer duration of action where it has to do with how that insulin is put into suspension. So when we talk about an intermediate acting insulin like NPH, it's essentially regular insulin, but it gets complexed with other things like a protamine, which is a protein, and a zinc, which then all form complexes that have to be degraded by enzymes within the subcutaneous tissue and that then promotes slow release because it takes time for those enzymes to break down that insulin. So it's gonna take time for that insulin to go from the subcutaneous space to the systemic circulation. Vetsalin's a little bit unique in that 35% of the insulin is in a soluble form, whereas 65% is in an insoluble form. So the soluble form, will be able to control blood sugar levels more rapidly, whereas the insoluble crystalline insulin complex is gonna to need to be slowly broken down and released over time. And that's where we may get the extended release of, of, of insulin um, to have a longer duration effect for that vetsalin preparation. And then we get into the longer acting insulin, so that's you know, these are the insulins that have the longer duration of action. They have a slower absorption from the subcutaneous space into the systemic circulation by, by different mechanisms. So essentially ProZinc has regular insulin, but it's also complexed with zinc and protamine to form a crystalline complex. And it's gonna take time for the body to break down that complex and be released from the sub-Q into the systemic circulation. Glargine and Dedimir work a little bit differently in that glargine forms, you know, again, smaller complexes or microprecipitates in the skin to then cause slow release. Dedimir is a little bit more unique in that it binds to a fatty acid chain to albumin, which gets dispersed throughout the body. Um, and, and so you can see, you know, all of these insulins have a little bit of a different mechanism of action, which ultimately affects their duration of action in the body. And so where this becomes important is that historically, intermediate acting insulins have been recommended for the treatment of canine diabetes. And ideally, we would like a duration of action anywhere from 8 to 10 to 12 hours with those intermediate acting insulins. But again, individuals vary where the duration of action may be too short in some of our patients where they are not going to be successfully controlled. And you're going to hear about it from your owners. <laughs> so, you know, what does that mean if the duration of action is too short? So from a hem hematological standpoint, these dogs aren't being, you know, maintained at adequate blood glucose levels. So they're gonna experience high spikes in their BGs. There's gonna be extreme variability with their blood glucoses all over the place during the day and night. And from a clinical standpoint, that means that owners are coming back to you and saying, 
look, I just, I keep waking up in the middle of the night because my dog's getting up. They want to drink a ton of water. They, they then need to ask to go outside. I'm not getting any sleep because that duration of action is too short. And dogs will respond to those excessive spikes in their blood sugar through PUPD, ravenous appetite, weight loss, overall uncontrolled clinical symptoms. So it, essentially, if that's the case, where if the duration of action is too short, where our diabetic patients are not being successfully managed, then perhaps they require a longer acting insulin or the duration of action is more like 12 to 24 hours to best control their diabetes so that we can avoid extreme highs and extreme variability day and night with regards to blood sugar levels. So Prozinc, so again, this is our, our FDA approved uh, second U40 insulin preparation that we can use for both dogs and cats. And because of its duration of action being a longer acting insulin with a duration of action anywhere from 16 to 24 hours, it is labeled for once daily dosing. Um, however, some dogs may need twice daily dosing. The field study that was performed taking a look at just over 200 diabetic dogs receiving this prozinc insulin, about 72% of them were successfully treated with this longer acting insulin. And so what does successful treatment mean? Well, these dogs had to have improvement in their clinical symptoms where they were no longer PUPD, their weight stabilized, and they had to have some sort of hematological improvement as well. So they either needed improved fructosamine levels, they needed an improved blood sugar nadir, or a change in their mean blood sugars throughout the day in order to be deemed a success. So both clinical and hematological improvement. So being labeled for once daily dosing because of its extended duration of action, again, even in this field study, uh, although the majority of dogs uh, were successfully treated with once a day Prozinc, there were some dogs that needed BID dosing. And so if that is the case, where you know we're starting with once a day, but we're not gaining adequate control, Prozinc can be administered on a BID protocol, where each dose should be about 25% less than the once daily dose administered. So for example, if a dog received 10 units of Prozinc and we were looking to move towards a, a BID schedule, then we would be looking at uh, seven units of Prozinc twice a day, would be how that works. So starting insulin doses here, just a recap, reminding us of the veterinary and the human preparations that are out there. Um, Prozinc, anywhere from half to one unit per kig once a day. Um, however, the majority of dogs getting away with half to 0.75 units per kig once a day, that would be an adequate starting point for the majority of patients. Reminding you again, looking at the Detamir starting doses, it's much more potent than the other insulin, so that's where the lower unit per kg dose is coming from. And so how do we monitor these patients? So we choose the insulin. Well, again, we have to practice patients because these our diabetic patients, it can take weeks for them to get decently regulated. Um, and as long as they're clinically doing well and stable, we can take those, those next several weeks to, to really let the insulin do its job. We're still checking in with the families. So after the first week of therapy, I'm calling owners, how's the PUPD? How's the polyphagia? Has that abated at all? Um, and I certainly want to get a weight check in to make sure that, that we're stable and that, and that we're not losing further. Owners can utilize the urine strips at home to see if their dogs are having daily glucose or daily ketones in their urine that, that may need to be addressed, but it's another way for owners to feel like they're um, you know, playing an integral role in managing their pet's diabetes. And it's helpful for us. It's additional information for us as veterinary professionals as well to understand if we're having multiple days of ketones in the urine where insulin does need to be adjusted sooner rather than later. 
If the patient is overall stable, um, rechecking fructosamines two to three weeks after starting insulin or making an insulin change would be very appropriate, as long as the patient is stable. If clinically the patient is not stable or hypoglycemia is suspected, a fructosamine is not good enough. That's when we want to reach for our um, either veterinary calibrated glucometers to measure blood glucose levels, or we're reaching for the Freestyle Libre interstitial glucose monitoring system to better understand the day-to-day -day blood glucose or interstitial glucose levels um, that those patients are experiencing. So many of you are familiar with the veterinary calibrated glucometers that are out there. They're great for use at home. Um, I love at-home glucose monitoring because you know stress doesn't play as big of a role in the home setting compared to the hospital setting. And maybe more of you are starting to utilize the Freestyle Libre, which is the continuous interstitial glucose monitoring system that has gained popularity over the last few years. Um, I, I ask you to choose your, your, your owners wisely, uh, just as you would with uh, using the uh, blood glucometers at home. So this, this tool, this monitoring system provides an incredible wealth of information. And so owners can get caught up in scanning their dogs and really focusing on the numbers, but it is so important to remind them that this, that this is merely a tool. It's not an end-all, be-all, um, but it's, it's really a tool to help guide us. But remember, it's the clinical symptoms that are so important in our diabetic patients to be mindful of. But just to walk you through, this is a, a prescription sensor that you can write for the patient and, and you yourself or the owners can obtain from, from their human pharmacy. And it comes here with a sensor and an applicator that the sensor fits into. So you line the applicator up with the sensor and here it is on the second image where you have this applicator portion and then this white is the sensor here. And this is the sampling needle that goes into the interstitial space to monitor sugar levels. And so we prepare the dorsum, you know, somewhere in the interscapular space, and that's where we apply this, this interstitial sensor. And we do have a few studies comparing the Freestyle Libre to the veterinary glucometers, and they're comparable. Again, this is not a perfect monitoring system, I can't say that enough, but it can be helpful for really challenging diabetics or if we're trying to figure out if we're having hypoglycemic events, um, this can be a great way to non-invasively obtain more information regarding uh, blood sugars. So this is the sensor here, this little disc. And so typically, depending on which sensor, it can last about 10 to 14 days. And you can write a separate script for the reader or the scanner, which merely gets placed over the sensor. And again, you can get a lot of information regarding glucose levels in the body. Owners can also download the Freestyle Libre app if they have an iPhone. And this is a really great way where the phone actually acts as a scanner. So the phone gets placed over the sensor and you can get a blood, uh, an interstitial sugar reading that way. So just recapping, things to remember with our canine diabetics. This is a common endocrinopathy in dogs as our dogs age. And we are so fortunate to live in a time where we have a number of different insulin preparations available because again, not one insulin is perfect for, for every diabetic patient that we treat. Be patient, it takes time to manage our diabetic patients. It can take several weeks to manage our diabetic patients. Remember that human error can contribute to are challenging diabetics, you know, going over with the owner what type of insulin, what type of insulin syringe, how they're administering insulin, all of these can play a role 
in successfully managing our diabetic patients. I know it seems simple and commonplace, but going back to the basics, human error can be a huge issue when trying to successfully manage our diabetic patients. And make sure that we screen for underlying infection, inflammation, or, or other concurrent endocrinopathies that may be contributing to lack of our, our patient's diabetic control. Um, do our due diligence and listen to our owners, do good physicals, run our blood work, making sure we're doing everything possible to understand all of the factors that go into our diabetic success. So with that, I thank you for your time. I have my email address here at the bottom. And so for those of you that have questions outside of diabetes and, and need an internal medicine consult, I'm more than happy to, to help you with your challenging cases. But thank you so much for your, for your attention this hour. And Amy, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Fenimore. This has been really informative and we do have questions coming in. Again, just type them into your the questions pane of your GoToWebinar control panel and we'll get to as many of these as we can. Um, so our first question, uh, what are the urine strips do you recommend? Sure. So uh, they're called keto strips. Um, you can get them over the counter at human pharmacies and they the human pharmacies only carry the um, the strips that measure ketones. But for our diabetic canine patients, it's really important to also be measuring sugar in the urine. So online pharmacies will carry those urine strips that can measure both glucose and, and ketones. Because unlike people, you know, people are so closely titrated with their diabetes that there really should be no glucose in the urine. But in our veterinary patients, we want there to be a little bit of glucose in the urine. So if you can find the, the strips that have the um, glucose and, and ketones together, that's helpful because we, we always want to see a little bit of glucose in the urine. If we're having multiple days of, of negative glucose, then we may be overdoing it with our insulin therapy. Yep. Great. Excellent. Um, what, are the, what are the most common treatment errors that you see and, and how do you avoid those? Yeah, so I I think, like I said, human error is just so incredibly common. And I keep thinking we're perfecting our diabetic demonstrations when our patients leave the hospital. And I, I, I think we do a good job, but um, gosh, it is still so common to not give the correct amount of insulin. And hopefully, you know, I do think that there's a benefit to insulin pens that, that are out there because owners can dial up um, the, the amount of insulin that they need to give. Uh, that can help avoid user error in giving too much or too little insulin. Um, probably not storing the insulin correctly. So um, also not, not handling the insulin correctly. So I didn't specifically say this, but you know, I, I think Vetslin is really the only insulin that needs to be rigorously, sh you know, shaken. Otherwise, the other insulin preparations need to be gently rolled between the hands. So I think all of those are just really common, common user errors that can be avoided. And asking once is not enough. I feel like you have to ask these questions of what type of insulin, what insulin syringe, how are you giving it every single recheck exam? It seems so repetitive, but I'm telling you in these diabetic patients where you think, you know, there's something else going on, it could be human error that's responsible. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, in cases with hypo or hyper albu al albuminemia, okay, I'm tripping over words today. <laughs> yeah. does, does the Denimer dose need to be adjusted? Oh, that's a really good question. And I think about this often. And, and although we don't have studies to really understand specifically how Detamir works in, in the dog, especially in dogs who have comorbidities, because let, let's be real, you know, there are a lot of 
protein losing enteropathy dogs, protein losing nephropathy dogs who have low albumins, where yeah, I'm pretty sure that's going to be um, affecting diabetic control. So what I would say is I typically am really judicious with my dose when I'm starting out in a patient who has an abnormal albumin level. And then I, I stay pretty on top of them. So they're doing glucose monitoring at home um, from the get-go. And then I'm I am adjusting their their insulin um, a little bit more rigorously because they have a comorbidity or abnormal albumin levels that may affect their um, their response to that particular type of insulin. Yeah, yeah. All right. We have a question about the Freestyle Libre. How is that applied to the patient? Is it simply applied to a clipped area of skin, and could a client easily apply it? Yeah. So I. I haven't gotten to the point where I've had clients apply it. Um, I'm sure it could be done by a client, but maybe I'm being a little bit too helicopter vet where I, and and I, and we don't charge them for applying the Freestyle Libre. Um, we charge them for reading the, the curves that they're providing us. But essentially how we apply it, um, we do clip an area and then I wipe it down with alcohol and I make sure it's completely dry before applying the Libre. Um, there's a mark on the sensor that lines up to the mark on the applicator. So you line the two up together and then you push the applicator down into the sensor and it clicks. And then that's what you use um, to then insert into the patient. It's You just gently press down on the prepared area and then the sensor will um, um, be placed. Before I actually, I should say, before I actually place the sensor, so the sensor, if you can imagine, let me go back here um, to this slide. Um, so when the sensor is actually in the applicator, I will do a few dots of surgical glue around the sensor um, because I do think that that helps with the stickiness of the sensor to the skin before I apply it to the skin in this image here. Uh, the sensors are not perfect though. They can fall off. They can sometimes have error readings where you have to replace them. Often I will place a t-shirt or a mesh vest over the Freestyle Libre area so that it doesn't get caught on anything. I try to not place it in an area where a halter will rub up against it. Um, so those are some things you can, you can do to help increase the chances of that sensor staying on. Mm -hmm. Oh, am, am I still with you? Sorry, I muted myself. Um, we have a question about, are you sedating your patients to place the Libre sensor? Typically, no sedation is required. Uh, I feel like it's almost like a sub-Q injection. Um, and um, when you gently press down to place it, I will hold it there for about 10 seconds. I forgot to, to say this as well. Um, and then I'll just use some hemostats to gently guide the sensor out from underneath the applicator. But typically, it's pretty comfortable for dogs. They, don't, they generally don't need sedation. Um, I have used this sensor in some cats, and there was one cat that I had to, that I had to sedate, um, probably not the ideal patient for. Um, Libre placement, but you know the benefits. I guess it's better than than blood glucose monitoring. You know, so it worked for us in that situation. So, all right, um, we are almost at the top of the hour, so this is going to be our last question for today. Um, what to do for cataracts secondary to DM? Mm. Yeah, you know, I that is an important part of the conversation that I always include with owners as far as what to expect with diabetes, because even the most well-controlled diabetic will, can and will develop diabetic cataracts. And so, um, you know, it can happen slowly or it can happen really quickly. And those can actually be a huge source of inflammation um, for our dogs. Uh, and it can be troublesome in managing diabetics if their eyes get really inflamed, secondary to their hypermature cataracts that can form. So eye drops, you know, uh, are 
our ophthalmologists like us to use fluorobuprofen eye drops uh, from the get-go, even if there's not a lot of inflammation associated with the eye. Because again, we want to keep the eye comfortable, we want to keep our patients comfortable, but we want to suppress the inflammation from those cataracts that can interfere with our diabetic regulation. Uh, we, I am fortunate to work with ophthalmologists that do cataract surgery, and so that is an option um, potentially for referral. It's just that uh, ophthalmologists may tell you that, well, we got to get the diabetes under control first before we even think about doing cataract surgery. So again, that goes back to doing your due diligence and working the diabetic patient up, controlling inflammation anywhere in the body, controlling infection, et cetera. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Fenimore, for your presentation and all of the expertise you brought today. Thank you to BI and Covetris for sponsoring today's webinar, and thank you to all of our participants. When you exit the webinar, you're going to see a survey. Please complete every form field. And remember, we manually process these CE certificates. You'll, you will not get your certificate right away, but we hope to have them in your inboxes within the next week. Thank you so much. This ends today's webinar presentation. Thank you, Amy.